please, uh, if you could please uh, introduce yourselves, we'll be delighted. If you'd like to switch on your um, videos, we can take some photographs for uh, our website. I think Mr. Jolly has also joined us. He was with us last time also from JCI. This is Anup Singh. I'm uh, from Center for Energy Regulation at IIT Kanpur. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kamran Vikki Jolly from Youth Corporation of India. Welcome, sir. Welcome to both of you. Hello. Yes, sir. You audible? Please go ahead. Yeah, I am Wakan Panda, secretary from Telangana State Electricity Regulatory Commission. Welcome, sir. Thank you. It's already two minutes past two, and uh, let us begin our uh, webinar of the day. Welcome, uh, Mr. Eric Thompson, and thank you for being with us uh, today. And I'd like to welcome all the dignitaries, all the participants who are with us uh, today. Mr. Thompson will be talking about the cost benefit analysis of the socio-economic and financial impact uh, of regulations. Uh, we all know that regulations play an important role in increasing the efficiency of the economy. But uh, the amount of regulation requ required in an economy is something that is debatable. Should it be minimal? Uh, is the question because we all know that overregulation can sometimes lead to a negative um, effect and imposing substantial costs and regulatory burden on the market players and consumers is a possibility. Hence, there is a need to measure and weigh the impact of regulations in order to justify its costs and guide the selection of policy alternatives to evaluate and improve the quality of regulations. Cost benefit analysis, of course, is a tool for monetizing and assessing the costs and benefits of regulations. It allows the measurement, identification, and analysis of regulations which are imposing an unreasonable burden and are required to be eliminated for the long term interest of the economy. Mr. Eric Thompson is our a uh, distinguished speaker who will be throwing light on the cost benefit analysis of the socio economic impacts of regulation, which will help the participants in gaining insight on the process of measurement of impact of regulation in order to develop an efficient regulatory mechanism within the country. A brief uh, introduction of Mr. Eric Thompson. Mr. Thompson is the founder of Envelope Economics, a firm specializing in the socio-economic impact of regulation and government policy. He has over a decade of experience as an economist and regulatory affairs consultant. Most recently, Mr. Thompson uh, spent three years at the OECD, where he worked with many countries to improve their governance of their regulatory impact analysis programs. Uh, Mr. Thompson co-authored several country reviews, including Slovenia, Croatia, and Portugal. He also worked for RIAS Incorporation on regulatory impacts analysis strategies. In Canada, a firm that specializes in regulatory impact analysis. In addition to his collaboration with the Canadian government, he consulted various international business associations to assess the impacts of regulations on their industry and national economy. We are very, very uh, glad to have you with us, Mr. Thompson, and we look forward to a very, very interactive session. Uh, let me. Uh, let me quickly lay out the format for this uh, discussion. Uh, we leave the house open to you, Mr. Thompson, after which we will be having an interactive session where the participants are most welcome to please ask your questions. You can switch on your mics at that point in time. And please ask. Uh, feel free to uh, ask questions. We can have uh, a discussion, if possible, uh, time permitting. Uh, but I request everyone to please uh, hear out the speaker. Since we are using an online platform, sometimes it become, becomes very difficult if we cross talk. So my request is please let's uh, hear out uh, Mr. Thompson. And after that, we will uh, ask our questions. which can be typed, but we would be delighted if you can uh, switch on your microphones at the end and talk to us. 
Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm glad that the number of participants is rising as I speak. And uh, with this, I'd like to again welcome you, Mr. Thompson, and over to you. Thank you. Yes, well, uh, let me just get the presentation open. Okay, great. So yes, uh, thank you very much for having me today. Um, it's it's my pleasure to talk about cost benefit analysis. Um, I've uh, I'll go to the next slide. So yes, as mentioned, I've spent about 10 years working in economics and specializing in cost benefit analysis. Now I have listed some of the kinds of um, of CBAs that I've done. So I've worked on temporary resident permits in Canada animal vaccinations, aquaculture licensing, uh, and even an ethanol and gasoline requirement for, for Canada. So I would say my specialist, my specialty is more the cost benefit analysis of uh, health, safety, and environment regulations. Um, but I do have some knowledge of, of, of how cost benefit analysis works for market regulation as well and for competitive measures. Uh, so in today's presentation, I'm going to try and focus on the benefits and limitations of cost-benefit analysis, uh, which I'll shorten to CBA. I'm going to talk a bit about how to actually measure and identify uh, costs and benefits. And I'm going to also talk just a little bit about how to put it all, all together. So in the appendix at the end of the presentation, that's after my final slide, I've actually included a list of useful resources so these are resources from other governments and I would say academic resources about how to actually do a cost benefit analysis of a regulation or an infrastructure project. So I think they're, they're very useful and they're things that I use, um, I use personally in my own work. So I hope that you will also find those resources uh, useful. So I'll start of course with just a, a brief introduction. So what is cost benefit analysis? Well, a cost-benefit analysis is just a systemic cataloging of costs, benefits, and uh, and risks of different policy options. So it's basically a way for us, for the government, to actually decide on what action that it wants to take based on a list of of different regulations, of different uh, policies, or even different in infrastructure projects. So costs and benefits are measured against the status quo. So we're trying to measure, find out how the government action will change the world, which means that we need to understand what the state of the world will be if the government takes no action at all. So in most costs and benefits, because we need to, we need to use some way to actually weight the different pros and the different cons. So we usually do this by by prices. It's not necessary prices, but I'll talk a little bit about how we actually weigh the pros and cons using prices uh, for different socioeconomic, socioeconomic factors. So I think another important thing is that a cost-benefit analysis considers who will be impacted. Because it's very often whenever we design regulations or projects that there are going to be winners and losers from this particular project. So you really so in economics, they actually call this the Calder-Hicks criterion, which is a fancy name to say that we want the, the benefits to be greater than the cost so much that the people who win can compensate, compensate the, uh, the losers of this regulation or of this government policy. So there is a, a CBA can be used at different stages in the process. I think that it's best to use before a decision is made. So basically the cost benefit analysis helps identify the best regulation or policy option from a given set of options. And that given set of options should include that the government takes no action. Um, and then after a decision is made, uh, cost benefit analysis actually helps the government determine if it made the right decision. Um, and this will help guide future policy decisions and will help the government understand if a policy should be changed or, or not. So this is a little small, so I'll use the, uh, the hand. I think you can see. So this is an example of the results of a cost benefit analysis that's actually part of a Canadian regulation. So this Canadian regulation um, was called the Canada Grade Crossing Regulations. So uh, 
for those of you who don't know, a grade crossing is actually where there is a crossing between a railway and a roadway. So because this point actually carries a lot of risks of uh, accidents and of injuries if a, uh, if a vehicle and their occupants are involved in a railway collision. So in Canada, they wanted to issue a new regulation that basically required a lot more safety features around particular grade crossings to help make them safer and to help avoid additional collisions and injuries. So you can actually see here that, so the first part is the benefits and they've actually quantified the value or monetized the value for uh, preventing fatalities, for preventing injuries, the uh, cost to railway companies for preventing derailments, as well as the other, um, other damage costs that would happen to railways and to grade crossing users, which are really people who drive across a, uh, a railway. They've also monetized the costs, so that's how much will actually cost to upgrade the existing safety infrastructure that's at each railway crossing. So I, I don't really like the, the Government of Canada's format because the important number here is the net benefits, which they see in the first negative, because that's when we expect that railway companies and municipalities will actually have to pay money to to install these new safety features at the great crossing. But then over time, we get the benefits of reduced accidents, reduced deaths, and reduced injuries. So then there's a positive net benefit. In this case, it's $45 million Canadian over time. So the Canadian government expected that the net benefits of this project will be about $280 million. Uh, based on $387 million in benefits and $126 million in costs. So this was actually really important at the time because when this regulation was put forward by the government, it was during a conservative government in Canada. And this was a government that was very hesitant to put more costs on businesses, including railways. So the government really had to demonstrate to parliament and really to its voters and citizens that the benefits outweighed the cost of this regulation. And we actually see that in this case, they expect that there's about three times as much benefits as cost for this regulation. So in addition, we see below that they have included, so the number of expected fatalities um, that this regulation will prevent. So they actually estimate that will prevent about, over the lifetime of the regulation, they'll prevent about 107 fatalities and 150 further injuries. So that's quite a significant uh, uh, bump in safety for, for Canada. And of course, this is, this is just the summary of a cost benefit analysis. Normally the actual cost benefit analysis itself would be uh, quite a bit longer. I think this one was 20 or 30 pages, but just the results of the cost benefit analysis ended up in what was made made public for Canadians to, to see and understand. And there's one more feature here that's cut off actually, but they've also included a list of the socioeconomic impacts that they haven't been able to, to monetize. Uh, and that would be just in this table just below here that where it was cut off. So this seems like it's a good way for the government to communicate that the regulations it makes are actually beneficial to society. So what are some of the actual challenges or limitations of doing a cost benefit analysis? Well, the first is that measuring costs and benefits might actually be, be quite challenging. We might not exactly know how much risk is going to be reduced or increased by changing a regulation. And especially benefits uh, may not be very easily measured or weighted. Normally, when the government creates a new regulation, it imposes some costs on businesses. But those are costs to buy equipment, uh, time, uh, or labor costs to deal with, deal with regulations, or deal with licensing applications. So those costs are normally easy to identify and relatively easy to be measured, especially when we know the number of businesses affected. But benefits can be a lot more difficult. 
if we're looking at something like pollution, how do we actually me how do we measure that in the change the actual health and well-being of our citizens? But then how do we actually monetize that? How much are people willing to pay to get this benefit? So yeah, it, it's often that we spend a lot more time trying to identify and measure the benefits than the cost of a new regulation. So CBA is often a resource intensive process. So often, at least in most countries in the OECD and certainly in Canada, a full cost benefit analysis is only required when a regulation is expected to have quite large impacts. In the US, it's actually, the United States only requires a full cost benefit analysis when there's going to be more than $100 million US uh, in socioeconomic impacts. So this means the government does need to do some initial analysis on any new regulation or a, any new policy project, but going the full, doing the full cost benefit analysis and the full quantification should only be reserved for those regulations that are going to have large impacts. So point three is that a, I mentioned that cost benefit analysis is useful to help the government make a decision. So a cost benefit analysis is not very useful then when the government already has an idea of what it wants to do and has actually already made that decision. So because cost benefit analysis is a resource intensive process, if it's not actually going to help the government make better decisions, then it doesn't actually have that much value. Of course, if the government just wants to do whatever it wants to do, then this additional bureaucratic work doesn't actually have any any benefit to the process. So point four is that uh, cost benefit analysis does require training, guidance, and support. And in most countries, how this works is that there is a body normally at the center of government or sometimes it's outside of government. And it actually provides the guidance to the regulator on how to actually measure costs and benefits. Uh, in Canada, for example, this is the Treasury Board Secretariat we're just separated from all the ministries and agencies that actually have to do uh, a, an impact assessment. But they are also there to provide the training, guidance, and support. And then, of course, number five is future risks and uncertainties will change the net benefits. Uh, when we do a cost-benefit analysis, we're really forecasting the future and how an issue might evolve and what we expect the impact of our regulation to actually be. So of course, this is always quite uncertain. So the, in the end, our cost benefit analysis probably won't be perfectly accurate. It's really to help guide the decision making of, uh, of the government. And it also gives us something so that after the regulations implemented, we can take a look back to see how accurate it was. And number six, I think is also very important, it's kind of related to point three, but the final decision is only as good as the options that we have compared. So just going back quickly to the Canadian slide, they've actually only compared two options here, which is where the government takes no action or the government implements this specific regulation that they've designed. This doesn't compare other policy options or other different regulations that could maybe get the same results, but at a lower cost. I have a message that the voice is breaking, but so I'll try to speak slowly just in case it's um, any issues. Yes, yeah, so the, the final decision that we get through cost benefit analysis is really only as good as the options that we've compared. So this is just the general cost benefit analysis process, which I'm going to go through today. So basically the first step is to specify the issue and options. We need to identify who's going to be affected by our different policy options and by the issue. We need to determine the baseline. So we need to have an understanding of how this issue is going to evolve over time. We also need to identify the costs and benefits and then measure the costs and benefits. So actually try to quantify them and try to monetize them so that we can compare them. And then the last part is once we've done that, then we need to discount the values over time because we 
care less about things that happen in the future than today. And we also want to do a sensitivity analysis or a risk assessment uh, to understand what things could cause our estimates to be wrong or could po potentially change our, our decision. And then finally, at cost-benefit analysis, we should actually take a decision based on the questions we've compared. Now, I've shown it here is a linear process, uh, but honestly, it's quite possible that maybe whenever we start to identify the costs <clears throat> and benefits of our different policy options, our different regulations, we find out that they aren't very good. So we need to go back and we need to re-specify the issue or we need to consider different options. Uh, so it's not, sh it's shown here as linear, but it's definitely possible to go back and forth between, uh, between the different steps. And I would say that the most time consuming parts of the cost benefit analysis uh, ideally should be specifying the issue and options. So really understanding what the problem is that we're trying to solve and what the government can actually do that will uh, positively affect that issue. And also, just because it tends to be a little bit more challenging, we put more time and effort into measuring the measuring the costs and benefits. So actually trying to quantify them so that we have an idea of how to weigh all of the different uh, impacts, socioeconomic impacts that we are going to have. And then finally, the last part is normally where we spend less time and effort. Because once we have the values, normally it's easy to decide how we value them over time. It only becomes relatively straightforward to perform a sensitivity or risk analysis. And then if we've gone through this process, making the decision should actually be relatively straightforward because we have all the information we need to make a good decision. So I mentioned that the first step is to specify the issue and options. And this is probably the most important step because I mentioned that cost benefit analysis is only can only be as good as the options we've compared. So to do that, governments need to identify the best policies and regulations based on what the actual problem is at hand and its causes. And then once it has a good understanding of the issue, what are the different alternative policies or regulations that the government could, could do. So the government could always take no action. No action is always an option for the government. Unfortunately, because this tends to be politically unpopular, governments will take an action even when they don't think that the costs will outweigh the benefits, because politically it's important for them to be seen as taking actions. But Honestly, the, there are a lot of cases when the government shouldn't take any action because the, the costs outweigh the benefits. There are also many alternatives to traditional regulation. I think regulators often focus on creating additional regulations uh, rather than thinking of other ways that the issue could be tackled. So for example, the, rather than a creating a new regulation, the government can actually review an existing re regulation or change its compliance and enforcement efforts of an existing regulation that could have a similar effect for a lower cost. Or the government could have an information campaign um, to help support existing regulations or programs that's less expensive than actually implementing a regulation. So I think that's why it's important when the government does a cost benefit analysis, they're considering alternatives to, to regulation because there could be less expensive ways uh, to meet society's objectives, to meet the government objectives without using, um, without using traditional regulation. So I think this the Vietnam motorbike laws are a really interesting example of a country really identifying the issue well. So in 2000, Vietnam issued a helmet regulation. And they basically right, said that, uh, that all motorbike users should wear a helmet. So they implemented this regulation. And then a few years later, they found that only about 10% of people were actually complying with this law. So is it kind of a good idea? Because there are a lot of motorcycle accidents in Vietnam, but they 
population that didn't have much impact because not many people were actually encouraged to 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 uh, So in a follow up in uh, it was about the mid two thousands, the National Transportation Safety Commission in Vietnam did a study and they actually asked people why they don't wear helmets. So what they actually found was that people didn't wear helmets in part because it, the law wasn't enforced that strongly. But the second part was that people actually just didn't like the aesthetics. They felt like the helmets looked silly that they and that they would mess up their hair, which sounds silly, but it's kind of important. So what the government, Vietnamese government did is that they kind of relaunched the helmet law, but they created a new informational informational campaign to help encourage people to wear helmets. And on top of that, they worked with producers to actually make brighter, more colorful helmets to help encourage people to use it. So that's why in this picture, you see almost everyone is wearing a brightly colored motorbike helmet. So they basically just strengthened an already existing law. Um, and they did this by really understanding why that law didn't work. And by reinforcing that law and really asking people and working with people directly to encourage them to wear a helmet, they had a really big impact. So this helmet law in just, the, just a year after it was introduced actually cut road fatalities by about 20% in Vietnam because now there were uh, fewer head injuries happening because of motorbike accidents. So it's a really good example of how understanding the issue and identifying the correct policy options uh, can have a really big impact. So part of the reason the Vietnam motorbike law was so effective is because they actually reached out and consulted with the people who would be who were directly affected by the issue and would be directly affected by the regulation. So part of the process of a cost benefit analysis is understanding the issue, but it's also understanding who's going to be affected. So normally the first step is to decide, well, who has standing, which just means what's kind of our cost benefit analysis universe. Normally when we're the federal or national government, well, that's the national, that's everyone in Canada or everyone in India. But sometimes there are cases when we want to even consider the costs and benefits to people outside of our country or outside of our usual jurisdiction. As an example, when I worked on the, uh, the temporary residency permit uh, policy, we considered the impacts to, to students who would be applying to visas and coming to Canada. So we included all of those applicants as part of our cost benefit analysis because they would be affected and how their behavior changes based on this regulation was, uh, uh, was important. So, of course, part of this, um, part of identifying the stakeholders is we need to understand who's going to be directly affected by the regulation. We need to think about what sort of impacts they're going to face. And we need to think about who might be indirectly affected. So maybe who's not the primary um, target of our regulation or the primary the primary user but people who might be indirectly affected so maybe with the motorbike laws well we care about road users and the government police forces who are going to um, who are going to actually do the compliance and enforcement but we also care about <clears throat> about the helmet manufacturers maybe is they'll be indirectly affected and they actually need to supply the market. So a key thing is then who should be consulted uh, during the process of developing a regulation and how should they actually be contacted? So I think it's most government's experience that when you start to develop a new regulation and if you hold an open public consultation, well, the high influence, high interest groups tend to always respond. So for example, in Canada, when they developed that new regulation on railway safety, the three major railways in Canada were involved any time they could be. Anytime the government said, had an open consultation, they would be at knocking on their door, trying to give them informa 
information to tell them to not do this regulation. So often these high influence, high interest stakeholders will approach the government as long as there's some sort of open public consultation process. On the other hand, there's this low influence, but high interest group. So that's often, the, these are consumers or citizens or even small and medium enterprises, small businesses that might not have the resources to participate in an open public consultation or maybe they just don't have the time or the knowledge to actually participate. I think this was, so for these consumers, for these citizens and these small businesses, the government actually needs to reach out to them, uh, maybe in the form of surveys or calling them directly because they're not very likely to just knock on the government's door to say, this is, these are our problems. So I think a perfect example is again, that um, the Vietnamese motorbike law because in Vietnam, part of the way that they developed a good regulation and understood the impacts that it would have on motorbike drivers was to actually survey them directly. So I think it's a great way to get, um, to get information from the citizens that will be most effective. Now, in the development of regulation process, you might have uh, the low impact group as well. So there might be, for example, rights groups or groups that are not um, not directly affected by the regulation, but then might want to participate and engage in the process. And there are also low influence and low impact groups like the media that just need to be kept informed, kept informed as part of the process. So I mentioned that we're, when we develop a cost benefit analysis and we look at the impacts of the regulation, we care about how the issue will develop uh, if the government takes no action. Because the, the net benefits, actually the difference between what will happen with regulation and what will happen without the regulation. So this is an example from the, the Treasury Board of Canada, Canada Cost Benefit Analysis Guide. So basically if we have some issue, let's say this is climate change. Well, it's getting worse and worse. Then the government intervenes at some point and then it continue, Then, if the government doesn't take action, then it will continue to get worse and worse until we have a lot of crop failures and health effects because of climate change. If the government does take action, well then we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and everything's good. So the net benefit in this case, or the benefit of with regulation to without is the dip, distance between these two lines. It's not the distance from how the issue is today to how it will be with regulation, but what the world will be without the regulation. So this is re this is really important. This makes cost benefit analysis a little bit a little bit more difficult because there are some issues that we know will get much worse over time without government intervention, like climate change. But there's some things where an issue will actually get better and so it will already be trending down and government intervention might make it a little better. So take for example, uh, airline accidents. Well, airlines and air travel over time has been safer and safer because the technology normally gets better and better. So even without government intervention, we'd expect that the number of airline fatalities per year, for example, is drops anyway without government intervention. But we'd hope that with government intervention, then it drops even more than we would expect. But then we need to be careful that we measure our net benefits with respect to the, the difference between these two lines, not against um, the seriousness of the issue at the time of the intervention. So now I'm just going to go over some of the different direct costs that, um, that affect businesses and governments. And I mentioned before, these tend to be a little bit easier to measure because normally we know the number of businesses or often we know the number of businesses and we can actually make an estimate of these, of these different costs. So for any new regulation, there are going to be costs to learn about the regulation to the business. Businesses will need to develop some sort of management strategy for the regulation. And this is actually one thing that businesses often complain about is that 
they spend a lot of time learning about regulation and trying to manage regulations when there are, the government makes a lot of regulatory changes. So when the government's constantly adding new regulations, these the seemingly small costs can start to add up over time and over successive regulations. So with any new regulation to business, often we're creating new, we're requesting them to purchase new goods and services or often to buy new safety equipment. In the case of that uh, regulation in Canada for railways, they had to buy new safety equipment that was specific to protecting cars and vehicles at railway cr crossings. So often businesses need to purchase some, some sort of capital that they'll need to keep up over time as part of a regulation. Uh, they'll also face some costs to manage inspections. So anytime they're inspected, there will be some cost to them. There are costs to them to submit and manage the licensing procedure. So in, in a lot of cases, these are relatively small, but if you think about the the submission and management procedure for something like a pharmaceutical, those are hundreds of pages of documentation. So beyond the cost, the fee that they pay to the government to license a, a medication, the actual process of submitting and managing a license and going through the procedures is quite costly to them. Then of course the businesses will also need to train staff if there are new procedures some businesses, especially small businesses, actually might need to hire experts to understand how to actually comply with the regulations if they don't have their own staff that have that ability. And another one that's, I would say, not very often mentioned is that businesses face costs of delays. So for example, if you have a new, this is especially true for major infrastructure projects. So say you have, you want to build a new factory, but it requires an environmental permit. Well, if that environmental permit process takes two years instead of one year, well, that one year of delay is that shifts the profit of that project one year into the future. So that delay has a cost on businesses and it has a, an indirect cost on how they actually take investment decisions. And then I mentioned, I'm more of an expert in safety in uh, safety, health, and environmental regulation. But there, whenever we are talking about market regulation or antitrust regulation or competition regulation, well, often a cost to the business is that they're gonna lose some excess profits or gross margins. Uh, this is even sometimes an explicit part of regulation. There are a number of European countries where they actually set a limit to the level of gross margins or profits of pharmaceutical companies. So this is a cost to the business because they might get a higher profit or a higher gross margin in a case where it's uh, where there this regulation doesn't exist. So for these costs, there are a few. The few key variables tend to be the number of affected business and kind of the operations of an average business. So because we don't necessarily know how all businesses will be impacted, we try to model one average business in this market or that we think will be affected by the regulation. And then we consider how their business currently operates and how it will change into the future with the new regulation. Now for the government, of course, government always face costs whenever they develop a new regulation. So the main one is probably that the government actually has to spend money on compliance and enforcement. So the government needs to train their staff on what the new regulation is going to be and how to actually implement that regulation. And then there will be time spent on inspections, complaints, and maybe some time on advertising and promotion. So actually helping businesses to understand what this new regulation means to them. And this can be, um, oftentimes actually I've seen that governments ignore this cost whenever a different level of government will be impacted. So for example, in countries like Canada or the US or Germany that are federal countries, if they develop a federal regulation, but they have the provinces or the states actually enforce it. So they will often do a cost benefit analysis and not consider the costs or the effect of compliance and enforcement on the, um, the provinces or states who actually have to take actions. I've even seen in some countries where 
they'll write a new regulation, they'll do kind of a little cost benefit analysis. And then for compliance and enforcement, they just say, compliance and enforcement will be done in the usual way. So they haven't considered at all what the compliance and enforcement costs will be on a regulation. On a regulation. And this can be really important because if the government underestimates those costs, they might get uh, a bit of a, a nasty surprise. For example, Canada instituted new, new um, consumer regulations for air travel at the beginning of 2020. And they actually ended up receiving about 10 times more complaints than they had inspected. And they actually didn't really invest that much in their compliance and enforcement efforts. So what's happened now in Canada, they created this new regulation. Uh, consumers are very happy about it and they're willing to use it, but the government didn't actually spend any money on compliance and enforcement. So now there's a two year black backlog to deal with consumer complaints about airlines in Canada because they didn't consider this cost. So on top of that, I mean, the government will need to review the regulation and do some maintenance on the regulation itself. Often the government has some sort of licensing cost or um, if they are taking licenses, then the government needs to maintain the IT databases and administration, and they need to actually deal with all of the, uh, the licensing and administrative procedures. <clears throat> As well, the government might also have costs uh, arbit of arbitration or court time of appeals. So of course, some people, if, they're, if, if a business receives a compliance action, Oftentimes they might appeal it in court, which also takes time for the government and also takes time and resources of the business itself. So normally the government has a good idea of what its cost can be or <clears throat> can have a good idea. And normally they'd measure it in the cost per enforcement action, the cost to deal with a complaint and the number of expected complaints, um, et cetera. So for citizens, especially when we're talking about uh, market regulation or competitive regulation, well, cost to them, depending on how the regulation works, could be that the citizens have higher prices or lower quality. Uh, for example, a new regulation, especially if there's not much competition in the market, could cause the, the businesses to increase their prices or reduce the quality of the goods and services that they sell to citizens. So that could be a cost on them. Citizens might also have fees. Uh, I've included travel time costs. This is actually more related to infrastructure projects. So for example, in the if we look at the railway regulation in Canada, well, if you put more safety equipment at a railway, then drivers will spend more time sitting and waiting at railway crossings in Canada. So that means that citizens will face some tra additional travel time costs because they'll have to spend more time in the car waiting, doing nothing, when they could be enjoying their free time or they could be working. So this can sometimes be a significant cost on citizens. So one thing I put a little warning sign here is that, of course, whenever we're collecting this data from from businesses and, cit and citizens, we do need to be aware of the political and economic interest when gathering information, especially on costs. If businesses know that you're doing a cost benefit analysis and you ask them about, about their costs, then they might inflate their costs to make it seem like the regulation is going to be less worthwhile than it actually is. <clears throat> Sometimes though, this actually can work against businesses because if the government really does its homework and does a good job of quantifying and monetizing the benefits, then even if the costs are somewhat exaggerated by the businesses, it really looks like that the, this regulation will have a, a positive effect. So I mentioned that measuring the direct benefits of a regulation is often quite a bit more challenging because the question normally ends up, so how do we actually put a price on health, safety, and the environment? So there are different ways of actually measuring this, uh, some different methods. One's called the revealed preference method. So that's we look at the decisions that citizens and consumers make to create a shadow price or a proxy of how much they actually value that aspect of health, safety, and the, the environment. 
So one example is we can look at window washers. So there are window washers that work on the 50th floor of a building. And then there are window washers that work at street level. Well, if you're at the, on the 50th floor of a building, you face a higher risk of injury. So the question is, how much more do I have to pay someone to be a window washer on the 50th floor than on the ground floor? So that's one way that we can identify how much people are willing to pay or in this case, willing to accept an additional risk to their, to their safety or to their health. Another one is the safety feature premium. So often if you go buy a car, uh, how much do you pay for additional safety features on a car? How much do people pay for an anti-lock brake system versus one without? So understanding how much consumers value those, uh, those small changes in their health and safety helps us understand how we can actually put a, a value whenever we look at our own regulation. And another one's housing preferences. And this is often used when we're talking about the environment. So for example, something like noise pollution. How much more are people willing to pay to live in a quieter neighborhood than a louder neighborhood, holding all of the other housing preferences co constant? So we can actually do a, run a model or ask people what their preferences are, preferences are uh, with respect to, uh, to noise pollution. And this can, can also work for, <clears throat> for air pollution as well. How much are people willing to pay to live in an area that has less pollution versus more pollution? So we can use these as a proxy, proxy values to understand how much people would be willing to pay to get the benefits of our regulation. So the second one is a willingness to pay. So we really ask someone just how much they're willing to pay to reduce their risk of a particular outcome. So this is actually how we construct a, the value of a statistical life. So we saw in the example of, from Canada that they actually counted how many lives they, that they expected to save and they actually put a value on that. So how they do that is they basically ask a lot of people how much are you willing to pay to reduce your risk of death by one one thousand? So a very small change in your risk of death. And people will give a figure like a thousand dollars. So then you can take those estimates and then aggregate them over the population. And then you can understand how much a population values reducing the risk of one additional death. So that's basically how they construct these values. So these values are normally based, um, they're normally done country by country because it's really going to depend on the cultures and incomes and preferences of people living in that country or living in that region, or sometimes even by their age, how much they're willing to accept or a small additional risk to their health or how much they're willing to pay to avoid a small additional risk to their health. Another way is to ask people, well, is called an option analysis. Whereas how much would you pay to know that there's a national park available to you that you can travel to? How much are you willing to pay to save the tigers? How much are you willing to pay to save the polar bears? So actually asking people how much they'd be willing to pay to, to get access or to protect, protect the environment. Then for Benefits when we're talking about antitrust and market regulation, uh, normally we're asking for consumers, we're looking at, so what is the amount current users would pay versus what they actually pay? And what are the values of the changes to product quality? So if we create a new antitrust or pro-competition regulation, we are trying to open up the market. So we'll have more people will be able to buy more but the profits to businesses will be lower and that net change will be, will be positive. So you expect that consumers will benefit more than the, the producers. And then sometimes uh, businesses will actually produce more output or have higher profits uh, given some resource constraints. So a good option, a good example of this is when a country adopts international regulatory standards this can help open export markets, which can make the exports of current businesses more valuable. And it can also help consumers because then they have access to certified products. 
<clears throat> so we can actually measure that based on the consumer's preferences for those products and based on how much we think that the industry is going to expand if we open that market by uh, using some sort of harmonized regulatory standard. So just to give you a sample calculation of kind of how this actually works in practice. So this is, uh, we'll say we have a new safety regulation that, requi that requires all workers at construction sites um, to have some sort of safety equipment. And it also includes some sort of new business licensing regime. So businesses need to be licensed and they need to provide more equipment for, for workers. So just for this example, we'll estimate that there's 1,000 businesses that will be affected. They each have five employees. And we think that there will be, the government will need to hire new staff and many, maintain a new database of licenses. Uh, I assume the new staff is for compliance and enforcement actions. And then we think that the new regulation is expected to reduce the risk of death per year uh, for, for a worker from just two per, per 5,000 to one to, to 5,000. So basically, we want to. So this is the benefit. So, how much do we think people value this one 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 in five thousand change to their risk of death uh, against the cost that the government and businesses will face? So this is basically how the calculation would look. So you have the cost of businesses to buy new equipment. So that'll be per worker. We have a thousand businesses with five employees. We have. I've just picked a value here. The cost of new equipment is $150. We could have a cost for a cost of business for the new licenses. So if these licenses are annual, this would be the time that businesses actually spend uh, managing the license, filling out the forms, and making sure that they are up to standard. So I've just assumed that this is $1,000. So then we get a cost, an annual cost of business, businesses of $1.75 million. And then for the government, I've assumed they have a high upfront cost of $1 million to set up this program to get the new databases. But then after that, they'll just have a cost of $50,000. <clears throat> so for the benefits for workers, then we just need to understand, because we have 5,000 workers and we know that it's a one in 5,000 change in risk. Well, we know that this regulation, or we estimate that this regulation should save about one additional life per year. So in this case, I've used a value of statistical life of $5 million. Although uh, this is, I'm, of course, this varies by country and even by even within a country. But we can use that to estimate that the value of that one additional life saved will be $5 million based on how much we expect people value a small change in their risk. So in this case, we see in year one, we have 2.75 million in costs. <clears throat> and then for benefits, we get 2.25 million. Sorry, we have 5 million in benefits for net benefits of 2.25 million. In later years, because we know that the costs of government are dropping, well then the costs are only 1.8 million. And the benefits are still the same at 5 million, so we get a 3.2 million benefit. So this is basically how the the actual calculation works for, for a socioeconomic impact analysis. Now, often we might have other costs and benefits that we actually can't actually quantify or we can't monetize, but we can always include those in our cost benefit analysis uh, as part of the report or as part of the decision making process. So the question then is, well, where do we actually find appropriate values? Because we need, we need data to understand how we actually uh, quantify and monetize all of these different costs and benefits in our analysis. Well, often you have access to primary resources, so we can consult with experts, consult with businesses, stakeholder groups, uh, directly with citizens, and we can talk to them. We can use focus groups, interviews, we can have open public consultation processes where they're allowed to submit information or to an opinion about a new regulation. Uh, there's something called the Delphi method, which is kind of related to consulting with experts, but basically you have send out a questionnaire to a group of experts to get an estimate of what they think the cost would be. You look at the results 
And then based on any pattern and the results that you get from the experts, you go back to the experts again. So it's an iterative process where you go back and forth with experts and, and slowly refine your quantitative estimate. Of course, the government's going to have, um, the government will have databases on markets and on compliance and enforcement. Uh, if the industry already exists, obviously there must already be some knowledge of how big that industry is and of what the issues are. <clears throat> then one relatively, I, I don't know if I wanna say new, but maybe less common is to do an actual policy experiment so there's one thing called regulatory sandboxes where you basically allow a business to operate under a new regulatory regime uh, with consumers, but kind of as an isolated market. So right now, I know that this is often used in fintech. So basically, or like online banking, some countries have allowed certain businesses to operate in kind of a regulatory sandbox where they can test new methods of finance and of engaging with consumers that's kind of outside of the rest of the market. And the idea is that by having kind of a controlled experiment, we can understand how the market would react if we allow this regulation to expand everywhere. <clears throat> then there are, of course, behavioral experiments where we actually test a, a version of our regulation in a sort of a contained setting, whether this is in a lab are just in one specific area. And we use that information to understand how the regulation would react if we were to uh, expand it to the whole population. So actually the pioneers of policy experiments are uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, who just won the Nobel Prize this year in, in economics for their work in policy experiments on regulation and on um, government programs. But but it's still relatively uncommon, I think, for government to do actually do policy experiments to help inform their decision making. So I see I'm kind of running out of time, so I'll try to be quick. But basic, but I would say another thing is, of course, we always have secondary resources. We can always look at the academic and non-academic literature to help inform our cost-benefit analysis. And of course, we can always look at other countries' experiences. So a lot of countries have similar regulations, and some of them have already done a cost-benefit analysis. So why not look at their their results <clears throat> and then think about how that will actually apply in, in our own country. And we can even look at how a regulation is performed in another country to understand how it would perform it in our own. So I'll go quickly on this slide. So basically discounting net present value, we value benefits and costs that happen in the future less, less today. So normally when we have a new regulation, we have high costs up front, and then the benefits accrue over time with some additional annual costs. But normally we value these benefits and costs less and less as we go into the future. So we need to have some sort of discount rate. Now this is often not that important for the calculation, but it does get important when we consider things that are very far into the future, like uh, greenhouse gas emissions, where we might have very high costs today, and our benefits only happen 50 years into the future. <clears throat> so I'll maybe make this my, uh, so making a decision. So the best option is not necessarily one with the highest net benefits because we might care about risks and equality. So for example, in this example, I've made the uh, option one has 915 benefits and option two has minus 550. But we see that high income households have a net zero, but low income households actually have a negative net 50. So maybe we don't like option one as much because it has a negative impact on low income households. And also, if we look at the size of these costs and benefits, they're quite large relative to our net benefits. So maybe this, if there's lots of uncertainty around this number, this 950 and minus 550 aren't that different anyway, because we expect that there's a lot of uncertainty and risk. So we don't necessarily need to always select the, or decide on the option that has the highest net benefits, because there might be some other factors that we want to consider. So this is my last slide. So 
just a few tips and tricks. So whenever you are doing a cost benefit analysis, I say the, that you should always focus the efforts on the most important benefits and costs. So those are the ones to the people who will be directly affected uh, by the regulation. Often there are many impacts that we could quantify, but often they're relatively small and only worth mentioning, but maybe we don't need to actually go through the effort to quantify them. So the second is that we can always start with secondary sources. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We can always look at the academic literature and find out what's happened in other countries before we start doing the consultation process and designing our own, uh, our own regulations, because that will help us understand what we think the impacts are before we ask people. And then a tricky part that I don't have enough time to cover really is that we need to be aware of double counting. So things like user fees and fines will cancel out. If we say that businesses have to pay fines, uh, those fines are a payment from the governments to, or from businesses to government. So it's a negative on the business side and plus on the government side. So we also know that some costs that fall on businesses might be passed on to consumers. So you need to make sure we only count it on the business side or we only count it on the consumer side and not both. <clears throat> There's also some values capture many different impacts. For example, when we look at the social cost of carbon, that already captures the value of health effects, the value of pollution, the value of crop losses. So we don't need to go out and try to estimate all of the different values. We can just use one, which is the social cost of carbon. And similarly with the value of statistical life, well, this actually captures all the health and non-health costs of the risk of death or, or injury. Whenever someone says that they are willing to pay $1,000 to reduce their risk of an injury or death, that counts their expected lost wages and their how much they value their well-being for avoiding that risk of death or injury. So thank you very much for listening. It's a lot of information to cover in, uh, in one slide. But I look forward to taking your, your questions. And as I mentioned the slide after this, I've included a list of, of resources for actually doing cost-benefit analysis. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I think these are very, very useful insights for especially the regulators to make important decisions. Uh, with that, uh, we open our uh, question answer session, an interactive session. Uh, Mr. Anup Singh has a question. Uh, kindly switch on your mic, uh, Mr. Anup Singh. Yes, please ask. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Eric, uh, for an interesting presentation. And uh, it was really a, a long time after that, which I am catching up with the contingent value analysis and uh, and Merleys. Uh, I have just two questions, one which makes sometimes the choice for policymakers. Uh, uh, one is in the context of distributional impacts. Uh, like you yeah. already mentioned, if there are low income versus high income households. And this is something we encounter a lot where uh, the costs are to be borne mostly by, suppose, the individuals who are next to the site and the benefit to are somebody who is uh, 200 kilometers from the site, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, so how do we really address that? And second question is that, uh, which is a very controversial, I would say, and debatable issue in the economics literature also, is mm -hmm. about the choice of discount rate. So you have a big debate between the public and the private discount rate. So uh, how does the, uh, these methodologies have been able to evolve in the recent times? Um, yeah, I mean, the distributional impact. So because so cost benefit analysis, it follows idea, the net benefits are to society as a whole. So the idea is that you could you should be able to create some sort of mechanism where you can uh, kind of tax or take some of the benefit from the people who benefit the most and give it to the losers. I don't know of too many of examples where they've actually done redistribution because of a regulation. But for example, in in Canada, when they created or they did some changes to uh, free trade agreements between Canada and other countries, because Canada's dairy producers were going to lose out because of this new free trade agreement. They basically transferred money or offered payments to the dairy producers to accept this new uh, this new regime, this new trade regime. 
but it's true that it's often I don't think governments take much effort to actually uh, make sure that the people who lose from a regulation somehow benefit or still come out net zero. So, I mean, one way to do that would be if you know that businesses are going to face a lot more costs for the benefits of consumers, then you could lower lower taxes on businesses and raise taxes on consumers to kind of balance things up. But you're right. As far as I know, often it's up to the regulator to decide whether the distribution impacts matter and whether the government is going to take any additional action to kind of um, balance those distributional impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Oh, Thompson, and, uh, if you could um, also introduce yourself. Sorry if I cut you short there. Uh, are you asking me? Sorry. Yes, yes, Mr. C. Uh, yeah. I am uh, at the uh, Center for Energy Regulation at Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, my, my second question, yeah. Yeah, on, uh, on discount rates. So that's actually, there was a, a, sign a pretty big debate recently in the United States. Because for things like climate change, when it, if you do pick a higher discount rate, then that does make actions to protect against climate change seem less less valuable. So there's, I heard that the current administration was thinking about actually raising the discount rate to try and kind of make it seem like environmental actions would be less valuable. Uh, in most countries, what happens is that the there's like a central government body that just sets the discount rate for everyone. Um, for example, in Canada, I think they've set it at 7% if you include inflation, 5% if you don't include inflation in your estimates. But they basically base that on, I think, uh, basically stock market returns and then the long-term the long -term returns to government bonds. Um, and there are even, there are some people who should say that you should actually have a lower discount rate the further you get into the future. But I don't think, I wouldn't really say that the, yeah, as far as I know, the debate's not really settled, but generally someone in the center of government has kind of settled it for everyone and said, we're going to use this value. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Those are for the question and to Mr. Thompson for the answer. Any more questions that we can take? Yes, Ritu. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Thompson. The presentation was really good. So I would like to know if you could throw some light on the uh, non-monetary factors that we can identify uh, during the cost be uh, benefit analysis process. Are there any non-monetary uh, factors? Yeah, um, that is a good question. You know, one thing that I saw in um, with Canadian cost benefit analysis is often they mentioned that there's sort of a, a benefit to the accountability of government or to the perception of government that they include on the benefit side. So for example, by changing the laws of temporary residency permits, there would be some sort of benefit that people would think that the government is taking action. So they include that on the benefit side. I mean, sometimes it's really difficult to actually quantify or to monetize things like the the benefits of lower noise pollution, the benefits of of other certain things that people might not might not like. So often we just have to list those qualitatively whenever we do um, when we try to identify costs and benefits. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. So one thing that's actually often difficult to quantify is, so for uh, like having more products on the market. So like with pharmaceutical re regulations, there's often, there's a, if there are stricter licensing regulations for pharmaceuticals, then there are less drugs put on that market. But actually quantifying that effect can be extremely challenging. Uh, so often that's something that governments might put in the qualitative section just because it's very difficult to actually quantify. Um, 
or if you look at the these kind of indirect impacts to say investment investment in uh, research and development because if we have a um, say like a limit to the amount of profit that a business can make that will cause them to invest less in research and development and that will have an impact on the technologies they develop but that's very difficult to actually quantify we might need to think very hard about how we're, how we would measure that and how we might track it in the future with our uh, yes yeah, as, as part of our regulation. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Sharma, Arunee Sharma, you have a question. Uh, sir, first of all, first of all, I would like to thank you for the presentation. And uh, mm -hmm. my question to you would be regarding. How, what are the challenges that could be faced in a regulatory system to introduce a framework for cost benefit analysis? Like in India, we presently, I don't think we have such a system mm -hmm. for cost benefit analysis of regulation. Yeah, I would say, so I, this is actually a common problem in a, in a lot of countries, even in the OECD still that they have a lot of challenge putting in cost benefit analysis or what's sometimes called a regulatory impact assessment system. Uh, we actually just came out, or I don't work there anymore, but the OECD, a guide called um, uh, the best practice principles for regulatory impact analysis. They give some guidance to governments about how they should set up their regulatory impact assessment systems, which basically includes cost benefit analysis. So I'd say in my experience working with OECD countries, uh, some non-OECD countries as well, <clears throat> is that it's best if the, the team that sort of oversees the cost-benefit analysis process is normally located somewhere in the center of government because they're normally in a place where they can actually get agencies and regulators um, to actually do cost-benefit analysis. And then they can also serve as a point to get uh, guidance and training for it. It seems to be there There are countries that have tried to set up their cost benefit analysis systems within a ministry, but that tends to not be very effective because other ministries don't want to take their guidance or they don't want to, um, they don't want to listen to them basically. <clears throat> so I'd say that normally it has, to, it has to be a high level decision. Okay, thank you, sir. just wanted to mention that uh, uh, there is some literature uh, in the environmental economics and uh, mm -hmm. health economics domain uh, in the Indian context also where okay. uh, both the contingent valuation and the cost benefit analysis has been used. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I think uh, Abha Ma'am's uh, connectivity uh, has gone. Uh, so, Dr. Suhag has raised the question. Uh, sir, would you like to ask your question or should I read it out? Okay, so I will read out sir's question. Uh, so, Dr. Suhag is asking, uh, what, what is the way to work out cost-benefit analysis of advocacy versus enforcement of some regulation? Like, for example, in competition law regime. Um. So I, if I understand your, your comment correctly, if you mean um, trying to work out the idea between the balance between sort of informing and working with businesses versus the cost of actually an enforcement. And yeah, I think there's there's been some work done with the OECD where they've often found that they kind of go hand in hand, where there needs to be the government really needs to kind of inform the people, the regulated entity, the regulated businesses about the rules themselves. And it can't just be enforcement actions. Especially in some countries, if you have a lot of different businesses, a lot of small businesses, they might not be able to keep up with any changes in regulation. So that advocacy and that informing businesses becomes a major part of the, uh, of the regulator's job. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but... 
If you'd like to uh, speak up, uh, Dr. Soha, if your mic is working, you're most welcome to uh, ask uh, Mr. Thompson. Okay, okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, Mr. Shukla, Sarthak Shukla ji. Uh, costs and benefits calculated for any regulation are done on the basis of certain assumptions. What is the role of having an institutionalized flexibility of any potential uncertainties that might come across? Are monitoring and feedback mechanisms crucial while mandating cost benefit analysis? Yeah, I would say it, it's actually kind of interesting because most countries, even if they have a good regulatory impact assessment or cost benefit analysis system, often do not have a very good ex post evaluation system. Um, there are very few countries where they're routinely reviewing regulations. So I think part of the whole regulation development process that I didn't really talk about here today is to think about monitoring and evaluation during the development of a regulation. And you brought up a very good point is that there is a role in this like institutional flexibility because for certain regulations, while we'd expect them to be last 10 or 15 years and not need to change them, but if there's something related to technology, well, we might need to update that regulation relatively quickly, or we need to write the regulation in a way that it's a little bit, that it allows for this technological change. I just remember that there was, I think it was in 2006, they updated Canada's copyright law because in, in part, there is still a section in the copyright law that referred to Betamax tapes. So, I mean, so there does need to be some, some flexibility in the law to allow for technological change and some institutional flexibility. So it helps if there is a process to regular, regularly review regulations uh, in five to 10 years. Uh, in some cases, what happens is if a regulation is put into place very quickly uh, because there's an emergency situation, in some countries it has to be reviewed within two years. Otherwise, it's um, it's out of the out of the rule book. So in some countries, they've actually instituted kind of like mandatory reviews of regulations, uh, but only under emergency procedures. Thank you, sir. There was a question from Mr. Venugopal Sonku, which uh, was, I think, quite a brief question uh, and very important. Are there any other methods to evaluate policy decisions? Yeah, I, I would say the, yes, the other key one next to cost benefit analysis. So the first thing I would say is when you do a cost benefit analysis, it's not always necessary to monetize things because you might just have a list of impacts and you might have some idea of how much you value those impacts and how much they weigh. So, so you can do a cost benefit analysis without the monetization or quantification. But another way that I would say is probably the second most common is a, it's called a cost effectiveness analysis. So that's where you look at a particular outcome. Say we want to protect polar bears or protect tigers. So, we don't really know how to value the life of a, of a tiger, but what we might say is we'll have different options, the number of tigers that we expect to save and the cost for those different options. So that's called a cost effectiveness analysis because then we would know how much it costs per, per tiger saved or por, per polar bear saved. <clears throat> or sometimes it's used for health, we might say the cost per life saved. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Prasenjit Singh, Singh has a very interesting question that does cost benefit analysis prevent interest group influence? Um, I would say no. The cost benefit analysis process itself is not really about preventing influence per se. It's really down to the government to understand and to contextualize all the data and information they get to make an unbiased decision. Because my, my experience, I'd say every country I've worked with, I mean, business groups are always trying to kind of game the system a little bit. 
if they understand that their costs are going to be taken into account, then they might inflate the level of their costs. So the government needs to kind of think of that whenever they're taking, making their decisions. So for example, actually, one way is um, instead of asking the businesses who will be directly affected, you can ask their suppliers. So for example, if you know that the business wants to buy a lot of safety equipment, the business might inflate that cost. We ask the suppliers to those businesses because they have less, um, less political motivation, I guess. So it doesn't exactly prevent it. It's really up to the regulators to to try and um, to try and work through that. Mr. Gibson has an observation to make. Please go ahead, Mr. Gibson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes. So you talked about the value of statistical life, but unfortunately, the counterfactual to a person not dying from one cause is not that they live forever, but they actually die from something else. And so do you think we should actually make a difference between the likelihood, and this is particularly important when we're thinking about measures, deal with, for example, COVID and lockdown, um, mm -hmm. measures that uh, value older people differently from younger people or uh, people who are uh, more vulnerable differently from people who are, are very healthy. And how does that interact with the the economics of that sort of sensible approach with the being a totally unsellable proposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think that part of the reason why governments prefer the value of statistical life is because it doesn't make any assumptions about the person's age and just says this is how much people are willing to reduce their expected risk. But there is an alternative measure. Um, you have quality adjusted life years or disability adjusted life years which asks for this intervention, how much <clears throat> kind of how much well-being are we going to save? So in this case, it would actually be a little, it would be lower for, or a health intervention would be considered less effective for older people because they have fewer quality adjusted life years remaining. I think that's mostly used in the context of like really specific medical interventions. So when a hospital is making a decision about who to give a ventilator, they give it to the person they expect to have more quality adjusted life years. Uh, in cost benefit analysis, I haven't seen that too much. I mostly have seen people stick with this value of statistical life. Uh, I think just because it's, it's a little more general and doesn't make these um, potentially more difficult, uh, the regulator doesn't have to have that more difficult discussion. Yeah, so the regulator effectively avoids the, the, politi the politics of it by, to a certain extent, um, compromising on the economics. Yeah, yeah, I would say I would say a little bit, because it's, I guess the idea is we're trying to value how much someone reduce, how much someone values a, a small risk reduction to themselves, but not necessarily what is that to the health system more generally. And I think another thing too, I think, is it's often a little bit difficult to to decide how old someone's going to be whenever this happens to them. If, for example, like avoiding vehicle deaths, that's probably the whole distribution. So the value of statistical life is probably a close enough approximation. But yeah, if we're talking about something that's more specific or targets a, a narrower group of people, then we probably want to use a, a different measure. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I think we'll take the last question of the day. I think uh, Mr. Thompson has been very, very patient with us. Uh, Mr. Kumar Bijoy had raised his hands. If you'd like to, uh, oh, seems like he's left the session. Um, we'll probably, okay, I think with that, uh, we come to the end of this webinar. Um, and thank you so much, Mr. Thompson, for being with us and for a very, very enlightening uh, session. I, I have a personal interest uh, in regulatory impact assessment, and so I was really looking forward to this um, uh, session. And you have uh, opened up new questions. You've answered some. Thank you so much, sir. I yeah, like yeah. To thank you. Yes, please. Thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you, sir.
Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants for being with us. Uh, uh, I cannot name all of you, but uh, definitely uh, we are enriched with the presence of Mr. Gibson, uh, with our uh, colleague from uh, IIT Kanpur. Uh, some of our uh, esteemed members have left. Thank you, in fact, each one of you who's with us today uh, from different regulation, uh, regulators, and uh, you have really uh, made this session what it is. Uh, extremely engaging questions were asked and patiently answered and uh, very uh, promptly answered by Mr. Thompson. Again, uh, I'd like to extend my warm thanks to you and a very good day to you. Thank you, sir. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye bye.